Well, welcome everyone um, to Based on a True Story, a factual drama masterclass with the undisputed king of factual TV drama, ITV's Jeff Pope, and the crown princess of <laughs> factual TV drama, Sheridan Smith, uh, who has already worked with Jeff on uh, The Widower and particularly Mrs. Biggs, for which she won a BAFTA, uh, and their new collaboration, Scylla, uh, which is the life story of Petula Clark. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> is uh, is going to be showing on ITV in a few weeks' time. Yes. So let's just zoom in on that to begin with, because mm -hmm. Jeff, for you, I, I think I'm right in saying this is your first celebrity bio project. Is is that right? Well, I think Fred West was a bit of a celebrity <laughs> in his day. So uh, he didn't and sing Albert, though, did he? No, he didn't sing. Give grant you that. No, I decided after many years of um, of blood and gore to do something a bit fluffier. But in the Why? end, we didn't do it in a fluff. Um, the, honest, the, the truth is, I, I don't, never have a set plan. I don't uh, particularly uh, you know, have, have a, a preordained way of working. And I'm quite a creature of whim. And I made um, Mrs. Biggs with Sheridan and was really enjoying working with a strong female character. And um, I suppose I was in that mode and came across, and again, there's no set pattern to what I, I tend to, I read all, all non-fiction, and I can't remember where I got a little bit of it, but I, I started with the, with the end, which is something I do quite a lot, and I, and I dis, just discovered in reading about Scylla that um, she, her manager was Brian Epstein, and Brian Epstein um, uh, either committed suicide or died in an accident, we're not sure which it was, but... He died, and on, on the bed next to him was a, a contract for Scylla to present a TV show. And then I knew that she'd been tussling with him. She didn't want to do television. She was a recording artist. And yet, most of the 99% of the people in this room remember, really think of Scylla as the host of Blind Date and Surprise, Surprise, and those kind of shows. And so they think of her as, a, as, a, as an entertainer, as a television personality. So I thought it was good to go up to that point that, that from, we know what happened thereafter, which is she became a, a, a massively popular and, and loved television mm. performer. What happened before then? Yeah. So. Well, and Sheridan plays Scylla, of course, and actually, this being the recording career part of her, uh, her career, sings. And it is actually you singing, isn't it, Sheridan? Yeah, had a go. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? Um, well, it was exciting. I mean, often when they do biopics, you mime to the, you know, to, I could have mimed to Scylla's tracks. But we said early on when I was on it, when Jeff asked me, he'd mentioned, we talked about it briefly yeah. in uh, Australia when we were doing Mrs. Biggs, hadn't we, that you'd yeah. had this slight idea. Um, and then, so when Jeff came to me with it, I was like, of course, I'd love to play Scylla, but also terrified because she's such a known. I mean, you say to anyone, they'll do an impression. Everyone goes, oh, surprise, surprise, you know. So, so that terrified me. And we, we spoke quite early on. We didn't want to do an impersonation. And also, it's pre-blind date, as Jeff said. So, and so many young people, young generation, I, I certainly, I, I didn't know she had so many consecutive number ones mm. and all this amazing. And she used to sing in the cabin club with the Beatles mm. and hung at that in that Mersey Beat, you know, that yeah. 60s time that must have been so exciting. Um, so I had like three months of research and watching every interview and uh, singing lessons to try and sound a bit more like a, I mean there is only one Scylla but um, and so learning all the songs and we did it live we, we wanted to, Jeff wanted to uh, capture the emotion, it to be a story of the songs as well not just put, whack a song in here and we'll dub it on later so I'd have earpieces in and uh, sing it all live on the day which is terrifying, it's like being naked in front of a whole crew because no one else can hear the music and you're just singing away to yourself. But what was great about it was that we got to use all the live um, footage, so there was no dubbing of the singing, so any little cough or swallow or mm -hmm. um, you know, giggle in the middle of a song is actually on the thing. So. Well, my, 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 sorry, my, the, yeah. my, the couple of my favourite bits I've told you, there's, if you watch the series, you'll see she... <laughs> she Sheridan wore false teeth to... Well, shall I stop you and we'll watch a clip? OK because that might help to illustrate the points that you're about to make. All right. <laughs> Thank you. 
is, one of my favourite bits in that is, is she's got these false teeth in and she's, they must have dried on you or something and she's singing and then suddenly he goes and then carries on. It, and there's another one where, where she's in the cavern club and in the moment Scylla's kind of singing in front of her friends and God this is a big deal and you giggle. Uh, uh, you know, as <laughs> yeah. you're singing, and that's in as well. And, it, yeah. and so you, I like, I love that way that you put the performance into the song. As you say, it didn't stop, and then there's a song, and then start again. Yeah, oh, thank you. So, working with a living icon, mm -hmm. presumably you had to get Scylla's herself's consent to do this. How did you go about that? Yeah, I did. Um, one of the problems with the, the piece from the beginning was, well, there were a couple of problems, but I, I sort of had this feeling at the back of my mind, I thought the only way that I'm going to do this is if, not like, not like digging up dirt, it's, that's too crass a way of describing it, but I thought, Scylla, my impression of Scylla is she's such a skilled, when I first started work in television in 1983, that's, she was at the top then, and I remember passing her in the corridor at LWT, and and her and her husband. So I, you know, I had this fixed image. And um, uh, uh, a lot of what you think, when you think about Scylla, a lot of that early part of her career, it's very, everything was lovely. No one, there was nothing nasty. Everyone had a laugh. And even on blind date, if someone got rejected, it would be, oh, never mind. And, <laughs> yeah, everything so was lovely. Your hat. Yes. And so I thought I, um, but, but that, I have to get underneath that. So I knew it was going to be tough, and I, I spoke, and I, I reached out to her through her son, Robert Willis, who, who I'd sort of known because, because in, in the early part of his career, he worked at The Big Breakfast and GMTV and stuff. And I started with him and had a few meetings and coffees with him and gradually started to say, this is what I think. And I, I mean, I told him the span of it, from obscurity to Brian Epstein's death. And then it was, you know, he, he bought into it and he understood what I wanted to do. So I, I, had a, I had a fear that I don't want anyone to think it's kind of the approved cuddly version of her life. Well, that's, that's the worry, isn't it? Because mm. she's still alive. Yeah. She's still very much yeah. alive and kicking. If yeah. she was dissatisfied with this piece, yeah. she could cause quite a lot of trouble. Yes. So, did, I mean, surely that inhibits you when you're No, trouble, trouble's OK as long as it's manageable. I mean, the biggest problem I had with Scylla was sex, because as I was putting the thing together... Did she say no? <laughs> as I was putting the thing together, she, um, uh, it, you know, the, 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 she's had, she'd fallen in love with Bobby Willis, and well after her number ones, and, and she's made it big at the Palladium, and she's living in London, she marries. And the, con uh, the conversation I had with Silly, you'd, you'd sort of... The inf inference was that she was, you know, she was a virgin when she married, and I was thinking, I don't, I, I don't, I couldn't think how to. So I, I, what I wanted to say was, when was the first time you and your Bobby shagged? <laughs> but it was tremendously em embarrassing, and you should have. <laughs> the nearer I hinted to it, she kind of twigged what I was getting at, and then almost withdrew and said, to forgive the expression, and said to Bobby, uh, said, said to Robert Willis, <laughs> right, no, sorry said to Robert Willis, um, uh, I don't know where this is going, and it was back and forth, and I, I just thought to myself, well, it's not that I want to have a sex scene in it. It's not, that's not what it's about, but, it, you know, the point they become intimate, it, it, it says something about the relationship, it's gone to another level. And then in the end, I kind of... I clicked when I think it happened. And, um, but it was my mother-in-law was the person who... I suddenly thought, OK, that's how I do it, because... Um, my wife Tina's in the audience, so I better be a bit, better be a bit careful. But when my, uh, when, when my, when my mother-in-law and father-in-law, you know, when they were courting before they got married, he, took, he got permission from her dad to take her away to a holiday in Jersey and uh, thought, right, this is it, we're, we're not even on the mainland and I've got her in this, you know, separate rooms, but I've got her and plied her with lots of drink, got her back to the room, gave her sweet nothings and then got a slam door in his face and from behind the door says, I can't, me dad, like that. And I suddenly thought, Scylla's the same age as uh, my mother-in-law. And I, this informed then, OK, I understand that now. And, you know, I, I, it was ridiculous that they weren't together when they moved into a flat in London. And I, you know, it, it clearly says that in the film. And she was happy with it. I think she wanted it dealt with. 
Her fear was probably there was going to be some ghastly, smutty sex scene or something. But, so that was the, one of the biggest so, problems. So, hang on, did you, what did you establish in the end about whether they'd had sex? Well, I, I, I don't make a big deal out of it in the, in the piece, but it's very clear that um, they are intimate before... God, I'm discussing Scylla's sex life. And she, but, um, <laughs> no, it, it's in, in what happens is we... Um, they buy a house together, don't they? Yeah, they, they buy a house together and they move in, and then the dad comes to visit and twigs that, you know, because Scylla says, this is my bedroom and this is Bobby's bedroom. <laughs> and the dad twigs and then says, I'm not bothered. He said, it's our mother I'm worried about. Just be a bit more careful, because he's seen a sock in the bedroom. Right. So that was the, how we <laughs> dealt with Scylla, it. And Scylla, for the record, knew that that's how you were handling it. Correct. In the film. Yeah. Okay. She was, we didn't talk about it, but uh, as I went through everything with her, she was very happy with that. So she didn't, yeah. So what... Did, interaction did you have with Scylla Sheridan? Did you, did you meet her before you took the part on, or...? I did. I mean, I, mean, I was lucky enough to work with Jeff so many times now. Like, that Jeff's scripts, you, you don't... You rarely get a script like it. Um, with Mrs Biggs, sopping wet paper, you know, and, and he's done it with Scylla again, and Scylla was a show-busy story. Um, but managed to find all this great stuff as an actress to play with. So I didn't want to get too involved in asking Scylla too many questions, and uh, I wanted to just do Jeff's story and do our drama, you know? But we did go for dinner, and um, I got a bit nervous, because when you've been researching someone for that long, um, like I did with Charmian when I met Mrs Biggs for the first time, and I was telling him, I'm shaking, you know, because you watch so much footage on them and read about them that you're in awe with them. You have to kind of love them because you're about to play them and in, inhabit them, you know. Especially Scylla. <laughs> I was petrified. Um, but we went out for dinner. We have a mutual friend in Paul O'Grady, so he was making everybody laugh. And, uh, and I kind of babbled on to her going, I love the 1964 interview when you told that guy, you know, that that was wrong, he said that. And then in the autobiography when you said this bit, and then in that bit, and she kind of went, what, what, so what are you talking about? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was like, OK, calm down, calm down. Um, but the next day, her son Robert rang me and said, look, Scylla wants you to have a number. Call any time you want, any questions you've got. And, um, and I spoke with Paul Whittington, and I said, I've said it's Scylla Black. Who's, who's Paul Whittington? Paul Whittington's the director, director okay. who also directed Mrs Biggs and okay. The Widower with me and Jeff. Um, and one, I'm, I was shy. I'm, I'm in awe of her, you know, it's Scylla Black. And so I didn't really want to be ringing up. And also, you don't want to get bogged down with, how did you say this line? How did you say that line? And, you know, I but had Did to... you ring her? No. So you had, a, you had the insurance policy of her, her number behind your ear. Yeah, and then I got to... I got scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I got, I got, I, because the thing is, we've got to do our version of it. And it's the same with, like, the impersonation. You can, you know, I, I watched enough of it to do certain words and the teeth change the way I speak and sing and... But you don't want to... I'm not an impersonator, I'm an well, actress, I was so you don't want to get bogged down with that, you know? With, obviously, with, say, Mrs Biggs, Charmaine Biggs is a, is a real person, but she's not a celebrity, she's not somebody who... 18 million people have impersonated the mannerisms of every Saturday night in their living room. So how do you go about, as an actress, drawing that line between performance and impersonation? We made the decision really early on because it would be a disservice to it. If I do a three-part drama talking like that all the way through and just trying to do what everyone does this impersonation of her, I think it's doing a disservice, you know. We don't know what she was like when she was at home with her mum and dad. And I think a lot of that came later, you know, and, and when people were loving, you know, surprise, surprise and blind date and it all became heightened Scylla, you know, mm. and showbiz Scylla. So we, we kind of show them what's going on behind the scenes, I think. And so I, I hopefully yes. took little mannerisms and bits and bobs, but, but didn't want to do a complete impersonation that Dur jarred with the audience, you know. During the course of the three parts, mm -hmm. that she, she changes from mm -hmm. yeah. the sort of ingenue Liverpool girl to yeah. a very big star. And it's not necessarily always a flattering portrait of her. Mm. What, what, how, how has she reacted to that end product? Well, this is the interesting thing. She's had the finished piece for like about six weeks now. And she, for a couple of reasons, as of now, I still don't think she's seen it. I think she's incredibly, first and foremost, I think it's very emotional because it's a love story with her and her husband who she lost in 1999. And mm. I think she's finding it very hard to see that enacted. And also, I think... She's sort of, 
terrified of, of what if she doesn't like it yeah. or, you know, so it's, it's a really interesting situation. And I've just been very honest when I've been asked about it at the press launch last week. I said, I don't think she's seen it. I think she's very nervous of it and, and she hasn't yet seen it. And I don't think that's a bad signal to send out to the wider public that um, obviously honesty is always the best policy, but I don't think it's a bad signal to send out that, uh, you know, this isn't too cuddly. You know, I think people want to think that it's got legs. If it's just, uh, I mean, when Sheridan's talking about her performance, you can, and I've seen it in a, no name say Patrick, I've seen it in some films where people can get trapped by that mm. because there are maybe three or four mannerisms that impressionists kind of grab and you think, wow, that's the greatest. But you get trapped by it. You mm. know, the minute if you were playing Jimmy Savile, as soon as you've gone, mm -hmm, as it happens, three times, what else? You know? yeah. And um, so I thought, yeah, we talked a lot about not getting trapped yeah. by... I've forgotten the original question, sorry. No, that's fine. It was Scylla's reaction, which she hasn't, so, she hasn't yeah, had she one. Still had, she, she hasn't, hasn't had one. No, she hasn't had one, and uh, I think she probably has seen it, but she just doesn't know what to say or what to do. OK. So, this is your third collaboration. Mm -hmm. Jeff, it's for you, I think, 22 years now, You since the full original... Uh, Brinks Matt robbery film that you made, yeah. Fool's Gold. You've been doing on and off yeah. factual drama. Yeah. I want to show a clip of uh, Dirty Filthy Love, which okay. is from 2004, yeah. I think. God, 10 years ago. Yeah, which was about OCD and Tourette's. Yeah. So let's take a look. <laughs> so this story was not based... He's not a true character, I think, Mark Furness, the... the a guy that Michael Sheen is playing mm -hmm. there, but it was kind of based on fact, wasn't it, that film? Yes, it was. Uh, uh, he was, a, he was a, a version of a really good friend of mine, Ian Paulson Davis, who's a, an actor who suffers from OCD and Tourette's. And um, I, I, it, it was, it was a, uh, the thing I most remember a, a, about that piece was... Um, that you, to, to work with an actor as good as, as Michael Sheen, you realise that... You, I went into that phase where your work en, can enter another dimension. I've always never had... A, I'm not a frustrated director or, or a frustrated actor. And um, I've always enjoyed the process of handing over a script to a director, to an actress like Sheridan, and seeing what they'll make of it. And that was, that was an incredible moment when I watched the rushes and saw the first cuts of that to see what he'd done with it. And um, it, 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 it sort of opened another dimension for me, you know. It, it, it so by, what, 2003, when that project came about, yeah. you were obviously at the point already in your career where you were, to an extent, choosing the projects or thinking about the topics that you would like to yeah. get involved with. How had you got to that point? Because you'd been a journalist to begin with, hadn't you? Yes, I was, um, uh, funny enough, my middle son's just going to university and I'm a little bit of me is jealous because because I I wanted to but couldn't I took the wrong subjects at um at, at a level um you know obviously I was say obviously but I, w I was good at English history the humanities and my my old dad and but at O level as they were then I was equally good at well I passed you know maths physics chemistry and he said no you want to get a job you want to take the sciences there's more work in sciences so I took those. Then I was adrift. I didn't, uh, so I didn't, I only got one A level. And um, so I, I, um, I got, a, I, I was lucky in that I got a job as a journalist on a, on a local paper. And that started me off. And from there you went to the six o'clock show, I think at LWT with a, That's right. a, a variety of people who became very famous and very distinguished. Yeah, there was, um, so okay, so in that room was, uh, was Danny Baker, who I Fun enough, 30 years later, I'm working with again now on a, on a comedy based on his life. Um, Paul Ross, uh, uh, Simon Shapps, who went on to become controller of ITV. Um, God, who else worked there? John Diamond, who was uh, Nigella Lawson's wife. Uh, husband. <laughs> Nigella Lawson was his wife. That would have been interesting. Um, Peter Mandelson was in the next office. It was an amazing... Period. Wow. I think I'm right in saying that you have been on staff at LWT I and have. subsequently ITV yeah. from that day to this. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I am a complete anomaly, I know. Um, 
Uh, they, they, but there were several other. I mean, it was an era so which. You just sit at the same desk and just watch the company change around you. <laughs> well, I, it's not far off the truth, actually. I mean, I started in 1983 and it was a, an open plan office and I had like a hot desk, really, and just a typewriter and a phone. There were no computers then. And in the, in, in the intervening years, I've had a variety of offices. At one point, I had this incredible corner office which overlooked the Houses of Parliament and the River Thames. And, and then uh, in the modern television world, as those BBC people out there will, will know, everything now, I now have a hot desk in an open plan office again. <laughs> I've gone full circle. Do you have a folding bike like Ian Fletcher <laughs> that you have to carry around? No, never, never, never got into the cycling to work thing. Maybe I should have done. I'd probably be a bit fitter. And you did a show which I think was called Crime Monthly, which yeah. is 15-minute kind of crime, crime watch style yeah. reconstructions of true crimes. Yeah. And then True Crimes with Michael Winner. Yeah. So you became very adept and, and, and very practised mm. at uh, extracting the essence of a crime story, I guess. I think that was the, the key to it. The key to really anything in television, I think, is, is stories. Um, and it's how you take material and shape it. Um, I, I, um, crime was really the bridge, because I was able to make drama about crime, which is very popular and populist. And so there was a market for it. But even as my first job was, it was the show, it was called The Six O'Clock Show, and it was really like The One Show, an equivalent of The One Show now. Yeah. And so we, it was the lighter side of life in London, and so there would be like five, four, four, three or four minute items, just about some funny quirk of life. But it was, it was the discipline of taking the material and shaping it into a story, which has stood me in good stead ever since. And it's in every, pervades every part of television now, you know, in ent entertainment on the X Factor, you, no one can just sing, it has to be, uh, my father left us when we were young and I've had to raise the kids and if only I could win, I could put them through school and everything. I was watching, I was saying this earlier, I was, I was watching uh, uh, the Olympic Games, not this one, the one before, and there was a, it must have been an afternoon and I think I was on holiday and, and there was an Italian swimmer and the, the ABC, the, um, the broadcaster, did a little VT piece about how she had, um, uh, in the race, so she'd been married to a French swimmer, and uh, then he left her and gone off with a female French swimmer, and the female French swimmer was in the same race as the Italian swimmer, and by the time they kind of like, ready, said he go, I was thinking, God, what's going to happen? You know, every, every part of television there, it's about stories now. Yeah. And, and so, and it's, and it's, the, 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 I think what, it, what I do now isn't wildly dissimilar to what I did then. Um, it's just, it's the expression of that. You know, it's, it's about taking, it's, it's about creating a universe of, of facts. So if we say Mrs. Biggs, you know, there, there's an enormous amount of time I spend on the research phase when I'm uh, digging up, reading it as much as I can. Yeah. Um, there's researchers that work for me and, and obviously we meet people involved. Yeah. Uh, in that case, we were really fortunate that Charmian was still around. Mm -hmm. um, but other people we met, and we build and build, and there is your universe. And the skill is navigating through it. What's the story? Because yeah. I've never subscribed to the thing of, perhaps some in, in the early days of factual drama, there, there were some that were great topics, but they didn't quite hold together as yeah. stories. There wasn't a narrative. A, yeah, as narrative. Yeah. And I don't think, I think that caption, based on a true story, I think you have to stay, you have to earn that. You can't just hide behind it and yeah. say, well, the reason that didn't quite hang to together the last third is, well, it, that's what happened. Yeah. I don't think you can do that. I think you have to find a way through it. So, Sheridan, when you get a Jeff Pope script, is it, can you feel that experience and uh, sort of journalistic rigour coming through? Yeah, in the, I mean, in the absolutely. You just don't get scripts like... I'm going to embarrass Jeff by saying it, but I mean, he's a genius. And when you're doing factual dramas like that, you have such a responsibility to, uh, you know, like Charmian's family, all Charmian's family. And when I remember reading them, there's five episodes, and, um, and, I, and I had not, I've never had it before or since, apart from Scylla and Widower, <laughs> which was also Jeff's. <laughs> um, you dropped where... one there, didn't you? Never had... <laughs> no. oh, I've done two more for you. the other one. Um, no, oh. no, but honestly, I, couldn't, I could not put it down. And, and I'd known all about Ronnie Biggs and the, tra and the train robbery, but not through the female's eyes. And Jeff writes for women so unbelievably well. And, 
I was with this woman the whole way and then, you know, she, and she, you shouldn't be feeling sorry for her and then you do and at times you don't. And then when she lost her son and I mean, I was in bits and I thought, oh my God, this, this is my dream role. Yeah. But there is no way I'll be seen for a big five part drama for ITV. I've just kind of mainly done cameos in comedies and um, I think I was the last to go in. And Jeff took a risk on me, you know, because I think it was down to the last two. The other lady had done a, a lot more drama and they took a massive risk letting me play this hu huge role, you know, but um, I was so passionate about it. And he's writing, it's just, it's all on the page. You don't really and have to do much you, acting, you, to be you honest. Had to, I mean, that was a, a, a proper job of acting because you had to age, didn't you, for by yeah, 20 years Yeah, from 17 so. to 37, yeah. yeah. This is this is the interesting. I mean, it sounds like we we don't want to do a love fest, but <laughs> but but the interesting thing. Oh, that's what I was going to say earlier about Scylla, Is I what I'm on set and I watch the rushes, and some, I'm not quite sure what Sheridan does because there's no question that you can believe she is this slightly awkward girl in her late teens, and then a mother of three by the end of it, and and I, I think so much of what. Sheridan does is instinctive, which is what makes it all the more mystifying for those of us mortals who, who can't, you know, can't reach for that. The, the, I will take this, because I, I love to, it's because it's absolutely true. She, Sheridan's right. When, she, when we saw her for Mrs. Biggs, we, we had quite a long casting process, and um, Sheridan's name was on, was on the list. And I, I must admit, I thought, oh, that'll be interesting. I knew she was from um, Yorkshire. In fact, I thought she was from Manchester because she'd been in the Royal Family. We met on the, <laughs> fleetingly on the set of the Royal Sheridan was, was Anthony's girlfriend in the Royal Family. Yeah. And I was shooting Bob Martin, the Michael Barrymore series, comedy series. And we met just briefly and, you know, one afternoon had a little chat and then that was it. So I was interested. I thought that it'll be, in I knew it would be interesting, but I didn't know what to expect. And um, so she was, she was the kind, she was the, literally the last one in that day. And then, so it wasn't a, after she, after she left the room, it wasn't a risk. Because even though she, Sheridan doesn't have um, kids, we all left the room slightly in tears ourselves because that woman has lost her son. Because there's a scene when mm. uh, Charmian loses her son. Yeah. And the way Sheridan, also that was the other thing, when she did the audition, she went straight for the jugular. She didn't, because we said, choose what scenes you want to do. She went for that scene, you know, when, when she confronts, um, Ron, I've lost my, I've been grieving on my own for my son. And it was just incredible. You know, we just felt we were in the room with a woman who'd lost her. Anyway. So the, Mrs. Biggs obviously is a, a, a loosely a crime mm. um, inspired drama. Possibly your most famous crime inspired uh, drama is Appropriate okay, Adult, uh, of which we have a clip. Let's okay. take a look. Oh, it's brilliant. Amazing performance from Dominic West, obviously, as, as Brad West. How do you go about... One of the things that I think people wonder when they watch a fact-based drama is mm -hmm. how much of these words were actually said mm -hmm. and how much have you made up? Mm -hmm. that's, those are the actual interview tapes, I think. Yeah, that was virtually verbatim. Um, that, the screenplay for that was written by Neil Mackay. Um, I'll, I'll just come back a bit. The... the Appropriate Adult is, is a, a really good example of, I think, of, of finding a way into a story. Because I'd, I'd spent a lot, you know, I'd known about, appropriate, about the West murders and read books, horrifying books. And so I, it had been at the back of my mind for quite a long time. And then, I don't know, just gradually I'd, I'd start to think... Because I, I, I was mesmerised by, by transcripts of that when he, when he, just, when he said... And, so you murdered your daughter? He said, yeah. He said, but the <coughs> problem is I couldn't get her into this bin because I, so I cut her arms off, which you do to fit someone in a bin. And it was that, the fact that, you know, the fact that it was just, he was talking like he was, you know, he was trying to fix a tap that was leaking or yeah. whatever. But how, what's it about? There's no, you know, but wasn't, it's not going to be, there's no purpose in getting into the minds of Fred and Rose because they're psychopaths and, you know, What's in there? Who wants to know what's in there? Um, so, and then also I think if you're going to... I mean, there are 12 women that were murdered by the Wests, and if you're going to look their relatives in the eye and say, we want to make this drama, 
they're going to say why. So what's your answer? And so I th in the end, it, it, it sort of coalesced. I'd, I'd read about Janet Leach in, in a couple of books, and it started to sort of dawn on me that that, that was interesting. If you, if, you, if you took... Because the key thing for me in a factual drama is who is us? You know, who's... who's uh, uh, Janet Leach is us. Janet Leach is, was a social worker who... Well, in fact, what she was, a mother of four who wanted needed some more income, so she decided to try and train as a social worker, uh, you know, because she thought that would be interesting. And she was on the road to that weekend when the police said we need an appropriate adult to sit in on an interview with a 52-year-old man. That's all she was told. Mm. And they did that because Fred West couldn't read or write properly. And an appropriate adult is normally with children who, who um, don't have parents, and they sit there and say, do you understand what the man's saying? Are you tired? Do you want to go to the toilet? Or anything like that. So... Janet's us, and she sat in, and it, I thought, then it started to click, because I thought, right, well, if we, take, if we start with Janet, all the murders have happened, we're not going to see any murders, which is a big thing, mm. what's the point, you know? Um, and then, then, really, the meat of it is that it was, she was Fred's last victim. It, I, I put inverted commas around that, because obviously, you know, I'm not comparing her ordeal to the 12, that, the 12, yeah. we, know, 12 we know of who died. Yeah. But what Fred did was because he knew he was going to go to prison for life and he knew he was, there was no hope. And here was this woman who was very Fred, exactly Fred's type. And physically, he was attracted to Janet's type, but also something about her personality he knew. So he said, he would say things to her like, I'll tell, there are others. Don't he said, I'm not going to tell the police this, but there are others. I'll tell you yeah. in due course, but I'm not going to tell them. I'm only going to tell you. So yeah. she was trapped. And... Um, she felt she had to maintain contact with him, and he gradually ramp up the terms of that contact, you know. Um, and she suffered awfully afterwards, you know. She had a, 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 a stroke and um, years of, of poor health mentally. But you saw the, mon the point of that piece was dr uh, evil is not um, conveniently... He didn't, Fred West didn't have fangs or green or red eyes or anything like that. Fred West was good old Fred with... You know, a smile and curly hair and, all right there, Fred, yeah. you know, who live next door to you. Yeah. And uh, it was the Monday, how, how he could do it, how he could operate that the piece was about. Obviously, for, the, for that interview scene and other police scenes, there, are, there is contemporaneous yeah. evidence, but yeah. there's quite a lot okay. in appropriate adult where yeah. Janet's at home with her husband yeah. who's bipolar, dealing with her teenage children. Yeah. Presumably, that was just dramatised, yeah. uh, I mean, effectively made up. Is that, is that right? I did try and... Swerve that question. <laughs> You're quite, no, I, you did ask that. Okay, so what, what, I think, what I think, my approach is this. I think that the, your duty is to stay true to the spirit of the story. There are compressions that have to be made. With appropriate adult, it was a number of many years condensed into two 90 minutes. Um, one of the big things, just to give you an example, one of the big things that you do is that um, if there would have been maybe 60, 70 different police officers involved at any different, you know, People are on holiday or people move on and someone else comes in. And so you need to condense that into kind of two, three, maybe four, so that people can understand and find a through flow. And obviously the four, the ones that you choose are the ones who are sort of there all the time. Yeah. Um, but you, 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 there are conversations that, that um, Fred would have had with Rose that we can't possibly know what was said. There are also Janet couldn't remember all that was said, you know, with with Fred, or, or, as you rightly say, with her husband that, that, that suffered from um, bipolar. So what, we, what, you're, what we're doing is, is, I'll go back to that universe that you've created, where you've, every labyrinthine facet of the story you've... So you're, Neil Mackay, when he wrote it, would have been drawing from that pot. And, um, and I think it's about staying fair. So in other words... We didn't create a husband that suffered from bipolar disorder. Mm. And, um, you know, we, we didn't create a great... Wouldn't it be a great twist if he said, I'm going to tell only you and no one else? We knew those things had happened. Right. Obviously, um, the dialogue would have to be created by Neil. But he's creating it from that pot. He knows how Janet talks. He knows what was said. He knows the... the, the the shifts in the story. So he's creating from a, a, a strong base. 
So Appropriate Adult was obviously a, a very, very neat way into the, the story mm. of the West. Mrs Biggs is a neat way into the story of the great train robbery, which of course has been dramatised God knows how many times. Yeah. What did you think, Sheridan, when you first read Mrs Biggs? Were you at all nervous? Because she's not entirely a sympathetic character, is she? She's not a heroine. Mm. No, but I, I mean, I was just, I, I'd never heard her side of the story. And as a woman and a mother, um, and there's lo lots of facts that um, she didn't know. He, he, the, there's ridiculous things like he won on a, the, he couldn't afford to yeah. buy the house. Um, and he was out of the game and he was being a family man. They had two kids. This was uh, early on before the robbery and they were going to lose the house, and he got involved in, he was going to do the robbery. I didn't tell Charmian. And the day before, they, um, he won on the bookies and he won the price of the house. And uh, so he could have not done it. Right. And he said, I can't pull out now. You know, he, she thought he was going on a tree felling job. That's what he told her. Right. And uh, naive as she was, she even, um, while he was away on, on doing the robbery, the police phoned uh, to say that Ron's brother had died and she rang the police to try and find Ron <laughs> so she gave away his alibi <laughs> you know so there's all these things that you just had no idea yeah. and then it was like do you stand by your man and he, they, he went on the run to Australia she had kids in tow she loved him I mean, she never met another man afterwards um, and I just found it really fascinating her side of the story it was like as a woman and as a mother and a wife. And did you read the script before you met the real Charmian Biggs? Oh, yeah, yeah. I read the script and learnt it. Yeah. Learnt it inside out for my audition and then uh, so when cried you... when I got the job. And then when I eventually met her, Jeff knew her for years. They'd been right. meeting yeah. for years, right? Built, developing it, yeah. yeah. So when you finally met her, mm. were there things about her that you learned that then could inform your performance in a way that even the Jeff Pope strip, script couldn't have, couldn't have done? Well, weirdly, we're both from Doncaster. Doncaster in Australia and Doncaster in England. Yeah. <laughs> so that was something we had in common. Uh, no, she, she was, um, again, but like slightly nervous at first, wasn't she? Kind of, because yeah. she's, I mean... She I, spent the whole first meeting. She, she's, she's, I mean, it's, 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 the, the end of the story, she got very friendly with Sharon. Yeah, we in, became in a very way. close by the end. But we still are. She's A, nervous, and B, Guardian. comes to light in the company of men. Um, I don't mean that in an improper way, but so for the first meeting, it, if, if I'm Charmian, she was like that. Because there, there was Danny Mays and me, and she just talked to us, and I, kept, I was kept I was saying, like... talk to Sheridan, and then occasionally, she, very politely, but she was like that. So she, yeah. she had to be break, broken down. I, I remember, I, the, the reason that story came about because of a documentary I saw, and in fact I discovered later, it was, it, it was on, it was, a, it was on a, a cable channel what, late one night, and it was um, Charmian. It had been made by ABC in Australia, and she was talking about um, being married to Ron and how she'd met him on a train, things I hadn't twigged before. So I, I knew a lot about the train robbery, but again, talking... I mean, it wasn't... That, that way in wasn't... Um, let's come up with a perverse way in. It wasn't like, oh, I... I just knew that the earthing about the robbers would... I mean, the BBC did it in the end, but they, they chose a way around it, and it was the 50th anniversary. Mm. But I felt, and ITV, who, who commissioned it, agreed, that just a, a head-on, this is... If the BBC did the robber story and the policeman story, so they balanced it. Yeah. But just a head-on piece about the robbery and the robbers, I don't know, I just I felt it wasn't... I just felt it wasn't... It didn't, it didn't click for me, I just, and I knew it wouldn't for the broadcaster as well. And I watched... Uh, but I, I, I watched um, Sheridan, and she was talking about Ron, and she cried. You know, she Ch talked Ch about... Charmian. Charmian, Charmian sorry. <laughs> talked about, I was watching Charmian in this documentary, and she, she talked about Ron, and she talked about losing her son, and, and obviously that was incredibly oh. emotional, but oh, yeah. she talked about Ron and how she still loved him. Right. And I just thought this was the most... And then I thought, God, you know, what she must have gone through, you know, uh, going out to Australia, um, being on her own when he escaped... So, really, it wasn't like... Oh, I just, what I suppose I'm trying to say is it wasn't, right, the anniversary of the Great Train Robbery is coming up. What can be a way into it? Yeah. It was the Charmian thing. I thought, God, that's... And it, I filed it, and then I was vaguely aware of the anniversary coming up, and then I thought, well, if I don't 
finally talk to ITV about yeah. this, the moment would have gone. Well, speaking of strong female stories, we've got one final clip, which is of uh, a little movie that people might have heard of called Philomena. Woo! <laughs> So did that meeting actually take place? No. So th that's a, a fictionalised yes. uh, climax to the, to the drama? Yes, it is. Uh, the sense of it happened in that Philomena did forgive Hildegard and told Hildegard that she forgave her, but not directly like that. Yeah. At that point, Sister Hildegard was dead in, in, the, in the reality. Right. Uh, Sister Hildegard had died by then. Um, but... Um, uh, the, the, this, that was a, it's interesting, Philomena, because um, it, it, Steve Coogan came to me with, with the idea. And, um, he, so, tell us roughly, for people who haven't seen it, yeah. just roughly, what the, very quickly, what the idea is. OK. He, he'd read a piece in... He, he'd bought the rights to a book without reading the book. He'd read a precy of it in, I think, The Guardian. And it was about uh, a little old Irish lady who had had her son taken away from her and who tried to find him. And the book was written by Martin Sixsmith, who was, a, at that point, uh, a, a world-weary government spin doctor, ex-journalist. And um, Steve's idea was... So the book, Martin Sixsmith had written a book which was all about Philomena and Philomena's son. And Steve said, Martin should be in the story, because he joined with Philomena to try and find... Yeah. And... Yes, you know, I, I could see how that would work, and I'd see. And Steve was really attracted to it because Philomena is roughly the same age as his mother. His mother is born in Ireland and lived in the UK. Philomena, ditto. Um, there were all sorts of themes that, that, that Steve was into that made him buy the book sight unseen. Um, but um, when, we, when we started to put it together in our heads, a, a screenplay, it was. I have this theory that. Um, Whenever you're putting together a, a factual piece, a, something based on a true story, there is a temptation to, as it were, kind of move, move back. I, call, I envisage it as moving away from the story and looking at it and then knocking the rough edges off. So that's how you tell a story and make it all fit neatly. And that, what you tend to do then is you tend to descend into cliché. You, know, you smooth off something so that it fits. Whereas I think my process is to go the other way, is to go even deeper into the story and therein, in the DNA of it, you'll find what you're looking for, the, what, the thing that unlocks it. In that story, um, I'm sorry if anyone hasn't seen it, but I'll give it away. The, well, they've pretty much seen it now. Well, yeah, exactly. There might be still some DVD sales there. <laughs> but um, what happens is they come together to, to find her son. And the first thing they find at the halfway point in the story is he's dead. And there was quite a lot of pressure on us, Steve and I, to say, why don't you have them come together? He, he, sorry, he died of AIDS in the early, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, he was, um, and um, in that era when the US refused to put money into AIDS research. And um, the, the, so the, the thought was, why don't you have them come together, they go on this journey, they find Anthony, and then he dies. And we knew that wasn't going to work. Mm. In our, we our heads, it wouldn't work. Much more difficult for them to come together, find him, he's dead. Mm. Where do you go now? But that, inf that informed everything. Because, again, talking about starting with an ending, we've, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was, sometimes it's staring at you, but we realised that the, the ending was the discovery by Philomena that all the time... And it's made so much more poignant because he's dead. Yeah. All the time she'd been looking for him, he'd been looking for her. And they'd been kept apart by, by principally by Sister Hildegard, mm. by the nuns, mm. who said to him, we don't know where she is, and said to her, she don't, we don't know where he is. And they'd even said it to him when he, was, when he went there dying of AIDS and mm. says, I haven't got much time left, I, I would really like to find my mum. I'm so sorry we don't know where she is. <coughs> so we knew we were headed there. Yeah. Um, but it, he had, you know, he, he, we, we, we were determined that, that when he died, however much wreckage it did to your nice plot, we knew that's when he was going to die. So you always have to take some licence mm. with the story. Yeah. Have you ever really pissed someone off <laughs> by telling their story in a way that they didn't like? 
Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I have. I did. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm trying to sort of, because I'm several thoughts then thinking, if I say no, it'll look like, a, you know, I, I mean, it wasn't quite what you, but a long time ago, I did a thing about um, some soldiers in Iraq called the, the one that got away uh, with Paul Greengrass. Who, what happened to him? And uh, he went, and, and uh, what, we, what we'd done was we, the, the book had been written by the principal character. Yeah. And they, they, it was a group of SAS men in Iraq who got detached and had to kind of march through the desert for hundreds of miles to safety, and only one of them survived. Or only one of them reached safety. A couple of others got captured and stuff. And several of them had died. One of them was uh, an SAS man. And when you read the book, what he'd done was he'd, it was much more critical of him, that he'd kind of got disorientated and uh, got overwhelmed by hypothermia and then sort of laid down and died. Um, but it was, as I remember it, there was a suggestion of that he, he'd sort of bottled it or some, that might be unfair, but something like that in the book. And then when Paul did the screenplay for that, he, um, what he did was he was gentler on this character and he kind of, he left it, more open as to how he died, more open to interpretation, mm. rather than saying he, he ran away and whatever. Yeah. That was it. He'd sort of run away at the contact, got lost, and then... And we got criticism for, for that. Um, for being too nice to someone? No, for... By, but in trying to leave it open, we'd let... You know, you could drive a bus through it and say, oh, you're, what you're trying to say is he, he was a coward, he did this. Right, and we were right. trying to sort of say he wasn't... He could not have been a coward, is what we were saying. Yeah. And um, it was just a lesson that, that don't, you know, tell the truth. What about Malcolm Webster mm. from The Widower? Because he's, yeah. he's, I mean, obviously yeah. a murderer. Yeah. And therefore not likely to be painted in a, a great no. light, but he's still around. No. That was when we got, so I've, Sheridan has been, she's had to lose her husband and go to Australia. And we burned you in that one, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Before the first outbreak, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had what my dad would call the short part. <laughs> but it's the only lady that he killed, so it was an honour for me because I, it's part of her family, you know, I wanted to tell her a little. I think, she, I think, you, quite, I think you quite like the idea of, here's Sheridan Smith's new drama, she's dead! <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, <laughs> um, but has he written to you? No, what, what, that, that, what was interesting about that was it was, a di it did, it was something different for me, that, because... Really, we were sort of on Malcolm's shoulder, which is something I never normally do. Yeah. So we, we kind of saw it from Malcolm's point of view. And what I think we found really interesting was that what, what we knew from his wives, because I spoke to his two existing, well, one wife. Surviving and one, wife. Yeah, who was about to be his wife. What, what we knew was this enormous capacity for delusion. And so, um, and I think what, we, what was really interesting about the start of that story was that he got together with this girl played by Sheridan, and they sort of experience those pressures that most couples experience, money worries, um, you know, diff he was working nights, she was working days mm. and stuff. And uh, he was a secret spender and credit card bills were racking up and she was responsible and started to say to him, what are you doing, you know, all this money. And, and so I imagine quite a few men have been in that position and it was, up to that point, we thought, well, this sort of is describing a lot of, potentially a lot of relationships, but it was then what he did that was the great shock, you know, the fact that he thought, yeah. I'm going to drug her. Yeah. And she can't talk to me then. Yeah. And then, of course, that went into murder and then this enormous capacity. So it was, it was, it was, it was well, has, I, I, has the real life Malcolm come back to you? Yes, he has. There was a very long nitpicking letter from his lawyer saying, um, the funniest bit of it was, um, what we'd shown, because we'd taken it from poli we, police records, and in the end we, we let the chief investigating officer be the arbiter, how did he do it? And he said, based on the forensic evidence, I believe he opened the boot and poured petrol onto the hot engine, set fire to it, shut the boot, put the petrol canister in the back, mm. and then walked away. Um, because the, we know the fire started in the engine compartment, and whatever. So... Um, Malcolm, uh, through his lawyer, wrote back and said it didn't happen that way, um, uh, as, was, uh, as was, you know, there was, there was huge doubt cast on this by several forensic experts in court. The, the fire couldn't have started here, and so the way you showed the fire being started was, uh, was inaccurate. 
Which begs the answer, well, would you want to tell us how you did start yeah. the fire? <laughs> yeah, you know? did he? No, he didn't. He declined that opportunity. OK. Look, we've just got a few minutes left to take um, uh, a few questions <laughs> from the floor, if there are any. Hands right. Yeah, this stops. Oh, is that you, Tara? Hello, Tara Conlan from Media Guardian. Hi. Um, hi. Jeff, could I just ask, are there, um, which scenes in Scylla um, are um, a sort of a product of, as you said, taking things out of the pot, your own creation? Um, uh, well, made up, I suppose, as it, as it were, to use sort of plain language. And also, Sheridan, which did you find were the most difficult scenes to do? You said, obviously, it's difficult not to do an impersonation, but what, what did you find was the most difficult scenes to do? If I, if, I, if I kick off, the only line in that that is guaranteed and can be verified as wholly accurate is when you, you say, I hope we're not going to be here all night, remember? Oh, yeah. With Burt Bacharach. With Burt Bacharach. The answer, is, the answer is none of the scenes have come out of thin air. Um, so I, I, I haven't created plot or anything or anything like that. So all of the scenes have been inspired by something. Um, but the how I've... How I've written them uh, has had to come out of my head, um, and then I would talk to Scylla about it, and she, you know, she'd say I wouldn't quite say it like that. I'd say it like that. And it, so, if there has, if there's a conflation, it's because, you know, we're, we're shutting what, ten years into, or no, seven years into a few hours. So, but no, there's nothing in it. That, that's the wrong sort of way of thinking about it. Nothing's been created out of thin air. No. Sheridan, what was the most difficult bit? Um, I found episode three weirdly a lot easier, which is the sort of that we kind of know more, and because there's so much footage on YouTube of the Burt Bacharach Alfie stuff, um, and you know that's when she was in the charts all the time. So that I was fine with, and that's when she was becoming a young woman. So, and I had the shorter hair, and I, and I, I, the director said I tended to ask less questions then. But all for episode one, <laughs> I'm 33, and I'm running around like a little stroppy 17-year-old, like whacking my brother with my shoe. And I kept going, I mean, is, this, is this all right? I mean, is this believable? Mm. Um, and so I found that quite weird, because obviously there's no footage of what she was like at home with the mum and dad, yeah. or seeing in the cavern. There's no, no footage of that. Yeah. So that was all kind of guesswork, really. But what Jeff had written, you know, was made it easier. But, but yeah, so it got easier the more footage I had to watch of her than the earlier stuff. Okay, other question? Gentlemen here. Hi, I was just wondering if there was any story that you've ever wanted to tell, but have been unable to because of like legal restrictions or somebody stopped you, and how as a writer you sort of let, let that go, really? Uh, I had a really long think, and still thinking about Savile. Um, I think I've prob probably quite got the way in. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of thinking about that is um, not this, not that. Like, you know, it's not man in Baco foil tracksuit saying, oh, and having a big cigar, you know. Um, uh, yeah, there's, um, there's something that I, I looked at a long time ago and then it went away, and I think Jimmy McGovern's doing it now. I'm quite envious of that, which is the... Um, the father, whose son was one of the red caps that was murdered in Iraq, and it's the quest to find out why. And he stood against Blair in an election in, in, um, in his constituency. That's a good story. Um, I, I, it's, um, it's an interesting question. I wish I'd thought about it, you know, if I'd thought about it more. Um, Are there any real life women that you'd like to write, that Jeff would, you'd like to, Jeff to write you? A script for that you'd like to play, Sheridan, in the fourth collaboration? Uh, <laughs> we couldn't possibly comment, could we? <laughs> no, I, 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 go on, comment. No, no, I, no, no, not for reasons of coyness. It's just you might go away, that's all. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, I said before, that said, I'll, that's, that's fine, I'll just work with Sheridan from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Wheeler quick, out. That's quick what final I'm question. If anybody has one? Someone here in the middle. Oh, that's Jeff's song. That's, that's, that's Jeff's song. Well done. Don't ask me why I said. What's Make your name? Sure it's 
Milo. Milo. Oh, yeah. Milo wants to know what's the toughest him. role you've ever played. Toughest role. Um, I mean, Mrs. Briggs um, was harrowing with the kind of the, the cut when she loses a child. The thing is with doing factual drama, which is why I love it so much, is that somebody's been through all that. It's not fiction, you know, and you have a real responsibility to their family. Um, and so so that, that, that was a tough scene where there was the car crash scene and she lost her eldest son. But I think probably, uh, so far, Scylla. Just because... I was so nervous before the press launch of the day, you know, she's so, she's so well known, you know, so, um, yeah, I think up to now that's... What about the one you just did just now? Yeah, that... that Not that, me, this is, you know, this is... Yeah. Something show has done. Shall I fashion my hair? Yeah. Um, I've just done a drama which is uh, out at the end of the year, which was about a friend of mine who... She died of cancer last year, um, and we tried to get it made for five years, and uh, it was a happy ending, because she was in remission. And she wrote a book called The Sea Word, and she's an amazing, funny girl. Uh, but it's, you know, there's so many scripts, and they have to go through so many people that she got secondary cancer, and unfortunately died last year. Um, but it was commissioned, and I've just finished filming it about a month and a half ago, and uh, so, in her memory, uh, and it was very emotional, but um, in, for her family wanted it made. Uh, my hair was wet shaved and I took my eyebrows off and everything. The least I could do, because I don't have cancer. Uh, but now it's this length. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was probably the toughest, actually. Yeah, you're right. Just on a show of hands, I think she could go without the wig now. Yeah, do you? definitely. Yeah. Self-conscious. I might go back under for a little while. Well, <laughs> for, fortunately for poor Sheridan, we're out of time. Please join me once again in thanking Jeff, Jeff Poe and Sheridan. <laughs>